This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers and we will be reading selected portions beginning with verse 4. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, desires, or lust. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and all the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. And then we read how that God promised to satisfy their lust, his displeasure with their murmuring against him and his provision. You want meat? God said, I'll give you meat. Not enough for just a day or two days, five days, ten, twenty days. I'll give you so much meat that you'll eat it, it comes out of your nostrils. And then we find that, verse 33, while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was even chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great, Plague. So he called the name of that place Kibroth Hata'ava because there they buried the people who had yielded to their lust or their cravings. Kita Hata'ava literally means the graves of lust, buried by their lust. We read in verse 4 again where this mixed multitude that had come out of Egypt with the children of Israel began to yield to these intense lusts, desires. They began to recall their old life in Egypt. Now, as we have pointed out before and will no doubt point out again, the history of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, going through the wilderness, coming into the promised land is known as typical history. That is, it is a type of the child of God coming out of the bondage of sin, coming into the full rich life of the Spirit in Christ. And so Egypt and their life in Egypt is analogous to our life of bondage in the corruption of sin. The slavery that they experience, the bitterness of that slavery, is analogous to the bitterness of the life in sin once it really begins to take its toll upon an individual. And so these people, having been delivered out of Egypt, began to think of Egypt again and that old life in Egypt. They began to think of Egypt as the good old days. Hey, that was the good life, man. You remember those onions and garlic and leeks and melons and cucumbers? Oh, man, could I go for some of that food now? This manna, sick of the stuff. It's bland, it's mild, it doesn't really have any zest to it. And, and they began to think of the old life and began to desire some of the spiciness of Egypt once more. This new food was just too bland. It didn't have the spice and the excitement of the food in Egypt. It didn't excite their senses. And so they began actually to long for Egypt again. Yearning for that, oh man, if we were just back in Egypt. The problem is a common one. They had selective memory. 
As they began to remember the old life in Egypt, they only remembered the good things. Somehow, they didn't remember all of the misery of their slavery. They didn't remember the beatings by the taskmasters when they did not fulfill their full amount of work. They did not remember all of those tears that they had shed as they were crying before the Lord for deliverance. All they could remember was, hey, wasn't that great, the onions and the garlic, that flavorful food, how our senses were so satisfied while we were there. Excited, really, while we were there. That is why when God instituted the Passover... At the Passover meal, they were always to have the bitter herbs. They were to eat those at the meal because God wanted to remind them, well, the, you eat that bitter, ooh, that's bitter, but he wanted to remind them how bitter was their life in Egypt. They had the salty water at the Passover meal. The salty water was to remind them of the tears, and as they ate that or drank the salty water, they remembered the tears that their fathers shed in that bondage. It was a miserable life. It was a horrible life. It was a life that was filled with tears. It was a life that was hard. But it is interesting how that Satan so often puts sort of a, a grid, a filter, over our memory bank. So that as we remember sometimes the old life it has sort of a pleasantness to us. And we forget the misery of sin. We forget the destructive power. We forget what it was doing to us and how it had brought us into this place of slavery and bondage and the, and the, the fearsome kind of being trapped and no way out. We forget that. We only think of the good times. Oh, the, it was such an exciting time. And, and, and you look back with a false view of the past. The mixed multitude began to crave exceedingly for the old life in Egypt. The mixed multitude were those who were not full Jews. They were part Jews, part Egyptians, part Jew, part something else. They weren't complete, total Jews. A mixed race, a mixed breed. Some of them were not even Jewish at all. They were just people that, hey, looks like exciting. They're going on a venture. They're going to settle in a new land. That sounds great. Don't like life here so much anyhow. And escapists, those that were just trying to escape. And going along with the crowd. Hey, everybody's going, let's go for it, man, you know. Adventure, excitement, and, and something new out there may await me. They're like the nomads today. There is an escapism called nomadism where a person moves from place to place because he's, he's looking for satisfaction or fulfillment. He, he, he thinks, oh man, if I just lived up there, then I'd be happy. And if I just lived on a ranch, and then if I just lived in San Francisco, and then if I just lived uh, in, in Hawaii, and if I just could be out on the North Shore, and, and, and you're moving, 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 trying to find the happiness or the peace or the contentment in life. And, and so there are always those, the mixed multitude are just looking for something new, something novel, something that uh, is, it sounds exciting, and every, well, let's go along and see what's going to happen. But they are those that really don't endure. Things get a little tough and all, and, and it starts to become sort of a daily routine. Then they're looking for something else. They're always wanting to be excited. They're always wanting to be, uh, you know, titillated in some way or other. There's that certain desire for uh, sensations. And they're, they're very sensual in, in their whole practices. Now, within the church there are always the mixed multitude. Those that aren't fully committed to Jesus Christ. Those that have made sort of a half-hearted commitment or what I call fad Christians. Hey, it's the thing to do, man. You know, and, and uh, 
A lot of the gang are gone. Hey, yeah, but you just go along for the gang and, and for the excitement. And unfortunately, uh, there are always those who are willing to take advantage of the mixed multitude. Trying to create fadis, fad, fadistic kind of things in order that you might be the in crowd. Oh yeah, I'm one of the Jesus people. You see, I'm wearing a beanie, you know, that says uh, Jesus loves you. And, and so I, I'm doing the thing that makes me a part of the, of the crowd. And, I'm, uh, and, and so you go along with it as long as it's exciting. We're having marches and, and we're doing all this kind of stuff. But when it settles down to just really beginning to walk with the Lord and, and just that daily walk with it, oh, you know, I'm wanting something more exciting than this. This doesn't satisfy my senses. Not fully committed to the life and the walk in the Spirit because that doesn't really excite their senses that much. They seek to bring then spice into the church. Now, there are men in pulpits today who realize that there is this mixed multitude out there. And so they take advantage of them by providing unique, bizarre, exciting kind of things to draw that mixed multitude crowd. Gene Scott is a classic example of, of the man who has, you know, spiced things up. Uh, so anybody looking for something that's really bizarre and weird and, and far out, uh, and they have, uh, they're rebelling against authority and all. Hey, this guy really appeals to them. You know, and you watch him and you think, how in the world could anybody you know, fall for that guy? Well, there's that mixed multitude, you see. They're not satisfied with the walk in the Spirit. They need something spicy and exciting and, they, and something weird. And... Uh, sort of exciting in a way because it is so weird and bizarre and, and so they follow after. There, there is the Peter Popoff. The, there are those people that like sort of sensational things and sort of Christian fortune telling. And, and so they like to go and be deceived by him. And uh, there are always those that are willing to prey upon the mixed multitude. Knowing that those people are out there, knowing that, you know, they're not really solid in their commitment to Jesus Christ or in their walk in the Spirit, but I want a crowd. So we have a very entertaining service. We have special celebrity guests every week. We've got the greatest choir and the greatest music and the greatest and the greatest. And, you know, and you come and you sit there and you're entertained. The mixed multitude. I love entertainment. I love the glorious music, you know. And, and, and you go there because they have a fabulously entertaining program. And the mixed multitude is drawn for that. You mean they just teach the Word of God? That's sort of dull, isn't it? You know, the bland kind of Word of God and, and, and no one's swinging from the chandeliers and... No one's screaming and running up and down the aisle. Well, you know, what do you do for excitement at your church, you know? <laughs> Always, it seems, there is the mixed multitude who have a craving after Egypt. And thus they try to bring Egypt into the church. They try to bring the world into the church. And it becomes just another worldly entertainment kind of a thing with spiritual overtones. We don't want to talk about Jesus because that might offend people. You know, some people are offended. And so um, we talk about changed lives. We don't talk about born again. That's sort of a phrase that identifies you, you see. We don't want to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit to change a man's life. There are other powers. Just thinking properly will do it, you know. And so Egypt is brought into the church. The mixed multitude loves it. It meets the needs of sensual excitement. 
But if we observe here, the craving of the mixed multitude after flesh was displeasing to God. God was displeased that they would look fondly back at Egypt and desire to go back to Egypt. God was angry with the people. He said to Moses, all right, you go out and you tell those people, you want to eat meat, I'll give you meat to eat. I'll give you so much meat that you'll have more than you can eat in one day or two days or five days or ten days or twenty days. In fact, I'll give you so much it'll take you a whole month to eat it. You'll eat it until it comes out of your nostrils. You're sick of it. And Moses said, God, now remember, there are over 600,000 adult men out there, plus their wives and all their kids. And you want me to go out there and tell them you're going to give them enough meat to last a whole month? Wait a minute, that's a lot of meat, God. Do you want us to kill all of our herds and all of our flocks? Or are you going to gather together the fish of the sea and dump them on us? That's a lot of meat, God. God said, you go out and tell them what I said I'm going to do because I will do it. And so Moses went out and told the people, you're craving for meat, you're hungry, you want meat, you're complaining against God. Okay, God will give you meat. And the next morning, God caused the wind to come in from the sea. And with the wind, there came these quail fluttering or hovering about three feet high. And the fellows went out with their sticks and they began to bat these quail. And for a whole 10 to 15 miles around the camp, these quail were coming in. Every direction around the camp were these quail flying in at three feet high. And the guy was out there batting them down and the kids were grabbing them, wringing their necks and pulling the feathers off and tossing them in the barrels. And they batted these quail all day long. They got torches and all night long they were out there batting the quail. And all the next day until the family that gathered the least amount of quail had gathered 860 gallons of quail. Ten homers. 86 gallons to a homer. And then they began to lay the quail out in the sun to dry so they could have quail jerky. <laughs> Here we see a horrible, ugly scene of men given over totally to their lust. When a person gives himself over to lust, he loses all sense of balance, propriety. It's a tragic thing to see a person who is really given over to lust because their life becomes so unbalanced. There's no moderation at all. They go hog wild. But the tragic thing is that they never find a place of satisfaction. When you give yourself over to your lust, the net result is that at the end, your lust is only greater. You cannot satisfy your cravings. A person who has given himself over to pornography, he has to keep going deeper and deeper, further and further into that realm in order to find a sense of satisfaction. But you're never really satisfied. It takes more and more and more. It's an appetite that doesn't quit, but only grows until you're bound by it, until it, it just has taken over and controls your life and there's some force or power that just controls you and you're drawn to it and you can't escape it. You've got to see more and more and more. And there are people that recognize 
the weakness of man and they make billions of dollars over providing different types of kinky kind of pornography in order that a person's lust might somehow be drawn but never satisfied. Never satisfaction in lust. It's a desire that only gets bigger all the time. The flesh will always cry for more, more, more. It is this ugly scene that the psalmist wrote about when he said, and God gave them the desires or the lust of their heart, but he brought leanness to their soul. And that's always the tragic consequence of giving yourself over to your lust. You suffer spiritually. You see, there is the world of the flesh and there is the world of the spirit, and really they are mutually exclusive. In that no man can serve two masters. And you're going to be mastered either by your flesh or by the spirit. And these two are warring against each other. Paul said, our flesh is lusting against our spirit, and our spirit is lusting against our flesh. There is this battle that is going on for the control of your life, whether or not you're going to be controlled by your flesh, or you're going to be controlled by the spirit. You can't be controlled by both. And if you give yourself over to the flesh to be controlled by the flesh, then it brings you into the bondage of corruption. It brings you into this desire that cannot be satisfied, but only grows. And so the people, though God fulfilled their lust of their flesh, yet with it there came the leanness of their soul. It cost them their relationship with God. Even as any time you give yourself over to unbridled fleshly desires, it costs you your relationship with God, your walk in the Spirit. You can't have both. Now we read that while the flesh was still in their mouths, they didn't chew it. The plague of God came into the camp and they began to die like flies throughout Israel. And so they buried that vast number of people and they called the place Kibroth Hata'ava, which literally means buried in their lust. What a terrible grave to be buried in. Kitah, I mean Kibroth Hata'ava, buried by lust, buried by craving. Now, it could be, and notice that they didn't chew, it could be that they were so hungry for meat that they began to try and swallow it without even chewing it. It's amazing how many people die every year choking to death on meat. It's not chewed well enough. You try and swallow it before you really chewed it. And, and many, hundreds of people are choked to death every year on, on meat, especially steak. It gets caught there in your throat and you choke to death. It could be that they, they were so hungry for that meat that without even chewing, they began to swallow. The, the bones got lodged in their throat, choked to death. Or it is possible that after over a year's time of this bland diet, mild diet of manna, that their bodies could not suddenly assimilate all of this meat. And they just gorged themselves on the meat filled their stomachs until they were just bloated and, and the body couldn't assimilate the, that much meat after the bland diet and that could have wiped them out. Whatever it was, the plague of God 
giving themselves over to their lust in such a way it killed them. Hundreds of them died there and they buried them in that place and called it Kibroth Hata'ava. This is the place, these are the graves of lust, the graves of craving. The people were buried by their lust. I think today of how many people are being buried by their own lust. People who live after the flesh today, we often refer to them as people who are living in the fast lane of life. They're going after it. Whatever is out there, they're out to get it. Living after their flesh, living in that fast lane, how many of them have been wiped out in that fast lane? I think of how many people are buried in the lust for alcohol. They say that there are six to eight million alcoholics in the United States today. Once a person becomes an alcoholic and remains in that condition, he has at the outside 16 years to live. Your liver cannot process alcohol for more than 16 years. The amounts of alcohol drunk by an alcoholic, the liver cannot process for over 16 years, and if you are an alcoholic, you really have a 16-year sentence life. You know, you've got, like the judge said, you've got 16 years. And I mean, that's it. You've got a sentence pronounced upon you as an alcoholic for 16 years, and then you'll have cirrhosis of the liver. Your liver will be wiped out by the alcohol. And all, of course, long before that, your brain cells will be wiped out too. But you, 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 you're buried in your lust. Destroys people. Imagine there's some six to eight million people that within the next six, six years will die of alcoholism. I think of how many people are being buried today by their lust for the perverted homosexual lifestyle. It is now estimated that there are three million in the United States who have the AIDS virus already. That is in stage one. In stage one, you don't even know that you have AIDS. The virus, though, is in your system. It takes up to five years for incubation. That is, before you begin to get the other results of, of the AIDS virus, before it begins to really break out. And so you can have AIDS for five years without any symptoms, without even really knowing it. And that's the danger of it, because during this five-year period, you're able to transmit it to others. And that's why it's such a dangerous, deadly thing, because nobody really knows if they have it unless they've had a recent blood test. And if you discover you do have it, you don't know how long it's been incubating in your system. But the incubation period is up to five years. Once you break out in stage two, you have two years to live. No one has lived beyond two years with stage two of AIDS. Last year, there was a reported 16,000 cases of AIDS in the United States. This year, they anticipate 32,000. Next year, 64,000. The following year, 130,000. The following year, a quarter of a million people. Stage two of AIDS. Buried in their own lust. Buried by their own lust. Tragic thing. Kibroth Hata'aba is a horrible place to be buried. To be so controlled, so ruled by your lust that it destroys you. Of course, do you realize that with three million presently with AIDS, that means within the next seven years, three million people will die in the United States as a result of AIDS unless they are able to somehow find a cure. That's why the thing is so frightening. Once you've got the AIDS virus, you've got at the outside seven years to live. 
I think of how many are being buried in their drugs. For that high, euphoric feeling or, or whatever they're getting out of their drugs, they've been trapped, they've been caught, they gave themselves over to their flesh. And what a classic example of how living out to the flesh doesn't satisfy. Because you need to take more and more and more to get the same degree of, of, of euphoria or to get the same high. Until you are taking so much, your system is so filled, you're destroyed yourself, and then you are buried in Kibroth Hata'ava, in the grave of your own lust. And there it is, the end of the road. But I think also of how many people are burying themselves financially in the graves of their own lust. How many people have really buried themselves financially because they desired that new car? Or they desired that new home? Or they were lusting after that new boat? Or these material things and they went into hawk? I want it and I want it now. And how many have run their credit cards right up to the max? Because they want things that they really can't afford. But they desire, they have this strong desire for these material things. The new clothes and all. And I've got to have it. And people bury themselves financially because of their own lust, their own desires. You say, hey, wait a minute. You quit preaching. You've gone to meddling now, man. But it's true. It's true. Your lust can bury you. They can bury you in a literal sense. They can bring you to your grave or they can bury you in a figurative sense. You can become buried in a financial morass. Hopelessness. Hopelessly in debt. Because you desire, you want. And you won't exercise any restraint or control. The answer for all of this is found in the Word of God. Paul the Apostle, writing to the Galatian church, said, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You find that your flesh is making these demands on you. The desires of your flesh have got control of your life and they're destroying you. You're being buried by them. The answer is to walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. You'll find that there's such a full satisfaction in walking in the Spirit. The problem that people have is this never-never land of the mixed multitude. They're not full Jews. There's not the full commitment to God. And that is the dangerous place, that never, never land. These are the people that bring all the problems in the church because of their desire for the spicy, the sensational, and the exciting things. They're used to that diet of the flesh, and they like that diet for the, that, that is scintillating to their flesh. But the answer and the cure is to commit your life completely to the things of the Spirit and to begin to walk after the Spirit. And when you do, you'll find that you can't do two things. You cannot be walking after the Spirit and still living after the flesh. But that walk after the Spirit actually puts the flesh in its proper place. It supplements the flesh to its proper order and it puts the flesh under. Now I'm still in my flesh and I still eat and I still sleep and there are still those things that my body requires but thank God they don't rule me anymore. I'm not a slave to them. They are not burying me. They take their proper place. But God never intended that any of you should be a servant to your flesh. A slave to your desires of your less. God did not intend that. God intended that you should have victory over the flesh. And that victory comes 
when the Spirit is supreme and you're walking after the Spirit and living after the Spirit, then you do not fulfill the desires of your flesh. You don't need to. Your life is rich and full and you're free from those things that were destroying and burying you. Kibroth Hata'aba, what a horrible place to be buried. Will that be written on your tombstone? Kibroth Hata'aba, he was buried in his own, by his own flesh. He's in the grave of desire. I pray not. But I pray that God will help us to turn from the life of the flesh and to walk after the Spirit, that new life in Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, speak to our hearts this morning, and may they be open, O God, to hear your word. We look around, Lord, and we see the destructive power of the flesh. We see how a whorish woman can bring a man to a crust of bread. We see how the flesh can just take over and distort values. Twist things. Oh God, what a perverted view of the world. To think of it as an exciting, desirable place. The things of the world as desirable. God help us to see the truth. May we eat the bitter herbs and drink the salty water that we will know, O oh God, the results of the life of the flesh. The grave that it will bring a man to. And God help us to exercise good wisdom and judgment that we might live after the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. Desire after the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. With the multitude here this morning, there are always bound to be among the multitude the mixed crowd. Those who, you know, still look at Egypt as rather desirable. They don't mind going over for a good meal now and then, you know, to fill up on those onions and garlics and melons and cucumbers. But let me tell you something. Trying to live in the middle is never successful. You're going to be controlled either by your flesh or by the Spirit. You just can't mix the two successfully. Ultimately, if you do not give yourself over to the walk and the life and the Spirit, if you don't give yourself over to a full consecration of yourself to God, you're going to find yourself drawn more and more towards Egypt, towards the flesh, until it gets its hold upon your life, begins to exercise its power, and it begins to destroy you, and ultimately you will be buried at Kibroth Hata'aba. And some of you are on that road right now. Some of you have already found yourself in the bondage of sin. You gave yourself over to the flesh and now the flesh controls and you can't stop. It's got a hold upon your life that you can't break. It's beginning to be bitter already. You're beginning to see some of the bitter consequences of it. And you desire and long for freedom and you say, I won't do it again, but you do do it again. And you can't stop doing it. Because it is exercising a power over you that's bringing you to your grave. But before you're buried in the grave of lust, I thank God that I can share with you God's truth. There is freedom and deliverance for you. You don't have to go on in the flesh. 
You don't have to be buried in the grave of craving. You can be freed from the power of the flesh through Jesus Christ who died to set you free. And you can live in the Spirit and you can walk in the Spirit and have that glorious satisfaction of walking with God. If you need help today, if you desire freedom today, I encourage you to go over to the prayer room and there find God's answer to your cravings, to your life. May the Lord be with you and may indeed this week you walk after God and after the things of the Spirit. May you hunger and thirst after righteousness that you might be filled in Jesus' name.